Hello, everyone. I'm Jun Yao, and uh, this is my partner, Tong Lin. Today, we will show you the mitigations adopted by Android OEMs. Specifically, in addition to Google official mitigations, some OEMs also add their own mitigations on their devices, which makes the exploit harder and harder. Our presentation uh, covers these mitigations and uh, show you how to defeat them. Before talking about these mitigations, let me introduce our team. Both of us come from core team, which aims to hunt and exploit zero day vulnerabilities. And our team has got 173 CVEs on Android. And uh, we won the honor of Google Android Security Touch Research Team in uh, 2017. Our presentation consists of four parts. In the first part, we will introduce the evolution of official mitigation. And uh, in order to easily understand the following case studies, we will introduce common root flow on Android. In the second part, uh, four case studies are proposed, which discuss the mitigations in detail. Specifically, in the first one, we will show you how to randomize, how to randomize thread info, which makes search our process difficult. And the second one, we will discuss the address limits and the UID checking. If we modify our process address limits or change our process UID to zero, our process will be killed. To bypass the address limit checking, we find a way to read or write kernel memory without changing address limits. And uh, we also find a way to disable the UID checking. Uh, in the third one, we will discuss uh, room encryption, which uh, make uh, disassemble kernel code difficult. And uh, the last one, we will talk about kernel address based layout randomization. And in the third part, we will talking about how to prevent privilege escalation. And finally, we will summarize our presentation. OK, let's start the trip. In recent years, Google has been committed to improve the uh, security of Android ecosystem to better protect the kernel. Google has enabled a number of mitigations, such as SE Linux, privilege access never, and so on. At the same time, attackers continue to improve methods to defeat these protections. OK, let's take a quick look back. Old days, when we control program counter in kernel mode, we can force the kernel to prepare a new cred and uh, commit it. To finish this exploit, attackers must know the address of these functions in advance. The most popular way to do it is to read the proc entry KL themes. The biggest benefit of it is that the exploit can determine the target address dynamically, which is bad news for victims. To count this uh, attack, three mitigations are proposed. In 2010, Dan Rosenberger commits a patch to the upstream. This patch has, uh, uh, has a new format specifier into the kernel, which hides the address information of symbols. After that, a researcher found another way to leak the address of a sock in the kernel. We can get it from chart, uh, XTQTarget UID model. If we know where it is, we can overwrite protoops in the socket struct and uh, make it to point to the memory we can control. 
Another mitigation prevents the kernel from executing shell code. It is called a privileged execute never to implement it. Um, add a flag into page depot, which indicates the kernel can execute code or not. If the execution is forbidden, kernel will crash. Also, the shell code does no longer work, but uh, uh, attackers can use gadgets to achieve their goals. Privilege access never is used to defeat, uh, define the gadgets. It prevents uh, gadgets from access user memory. If gadgets need to access user memory, it will be filled. On uh, ARM version 8.1, a flag uh, uh, added into status register, which indicates the kernel can read write uh, memory or not. To protect all the devices, privilege access never emulation is also implemented in Android kernel. On uh, ARM version 8, the TTBR0 ER1 register saves the base of translation table for user space. When the CPU switch to kernel mode, this register will be invalid. If gadgets access user memory, the kernel will crash. Before the CPU switch to user mode, or kernel need to access user memory, this register will be recovered. In order to easy, uh, easily understand the following case studies, let's look at a common root flow on Android. The purpose of uh, stage one is to read or write kernel memory. After that, we can disable SE Linux and uh, modify our process UID compatibilities and uh, so on. Before talking about these case studies, I want to explain that uh, some pictures show, some pictures shown in our presentation have been pixelated. Uh, we think that uh, it's necessary to hide some information to avoid being used for, uh, from others. When I test my exploit on target device, I encountered a problem. My exploit occasionally succeed, but uh, most of the time it has failed. So I recover, uh, reviewed my exploit code and uh, uh, kernel disassembly code. I found uh, something interesting. When the kernel calculate, uh, cal calculated the address of thread inform, it reads an offset from a specific address. This offset is initialized by the KTI randomized init function. This function initializes the offset, which is called KTI offset, according to the value of counter register. So there is an offset between thread inform and the top of kernel stack. This mitigation uh, has no influence on stage one of root flow because the setfs function can calculate the address of thread inform uh, automatically. So all the method still works. We can prepare a fake sock for the kernel sock IO control to prevent uh, recover our process address limits we can force the I.O. control function pointer to point to the end of this function. When this function is finished, our process address limit is modified, and we can read or write kernel memory. However, this mitigation does have, uh, have influence on stage two of root flow because we can't uh, determine the location of thread inform and uh, it's difficult of, 
to search our process task structs. But uh, don't worry about that, because we can read or write kernel memory. So we can easily read the value of KTI offset. Okay, let's look at the second study. On ARM64, when we issue a SVC instruction with the system core number, an uh, exception targets uh, exception level one is raised, then the CPU switch to kernel mode and jump to ER0 sync function. Because the raised exception is a supervisor core exception, so ER0 SVC function is called which search the target system core function in the system core table. When the target system core function is finished, the return fast system core function is called, which recover, recovers the register and return to user mode. The address limit checking happens be between return fast system core. It will check a current process address limit. If it is not equal to user DS, the current process will be killed. Due to the address limit checking, uh, all the method does not work. So we must find another way to read or write the memory without changing address limits. Luckily, gadgets uh, help us. When we control program counter in kernel mode, we can force the program counter to point to this gadget. When it runs, it overrides a victim function pointer and makes this pointer to point to the same gadget. After that, we can read or write kernel memory by calling this victim function pointer with different arguments. When my exploit get root, it wants to fork a uh, root shell, but uh, it failed. What's wrong with my exploit? I review my exploit code and uh, extract kernel memory. I find uh, another mitigation. After Snoop system core table, I find that uh, the kernel hooks the 10 system core function before calling this uh, the target syscall function. The kernel executes a piece of code, which needs one argument. The code has two completes to, uh, 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 to finish. The first uh, is to call uh, materials function. When this function is uh, returned, it will uh, search the target system call function in backup syscall table, and then do the real syscall. Now let's look, uh, unlock, uh, let's unlock the view of uh, materials function. I named uh, this function check process uh, cred, because the purpose of this function is to check current process credential. If current process UID is equal to zero, this function will conduct a more detailed uh, examination. If current process failed to pass the examination, uh, this pro uh, process will be killed. Before talking about how to defeat it, I want to talk about how kernel hooks uh, system core tables. When the kernel start up, the do security init calls call the functions registered in security init core section in order. There are two functions named hook arm64 syscore table and hook arm syscore table uh, will be called. The purpose of, two, uh, of both functions 
is to back up original system core table and hooks the target system core functions. Before uh, changing our process UID to zero, we must uh, uh, recover syscall tables. But the kernel read-only data section can't be modified directly. Uh, we must uh, make the memory belonging to this section writable, so page table work is needed. It's possible to do it in user space because we can read or write kernel memory. On ARM version 8, the TTBRY, ELY register saves the base of a translation table for kernel space, and there are two different translation uh, types, table type and uh, block type. If there is a table type, Android kernel use three levels of translation table with four kilobytes configuration using 39 bits virtual address. We can determine which, which type is used by uh, inspecting the record in the PMD. If it is a block type, uh, Android kernel use two levels of translation table, and each block has the size of two megabytes. Both the block descriptor and uh, table descriptor has uh, lower attributes. One of the attributes is uh, uh, access permission attribute, which indica uh, indicates the kernel can uh, read or write memory or not. To make the memory writable, we must, uh, uh, we need to clear the most significant base in access permission attribute. After that, we can recover syscall tables. Actually, uh, there is a simple way to disable the UID checking. We can change the uh, compare instruction to a NOP instruction, and uh, the UID checking will not be performed, and uh, we are alive. Okay, uh, my partner will discuss the rest of case studies. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Lin Tong. The remaining two cases, as well as the suggestions and the conclusion, will be shared by me. OK, let's go. Case study three, room encryption. First of all, one question we need to figure out is why mobile phone manufacturers want to encrypt the official room. My understanding is that the mobile phone's official room contains a lot of key information, such as the version of the kernel and third-party libraries, the address of kernel symbols, the details of file system implementation, as well as security researchers who are familiar with vulnerability exploitation have such a consensus. Some specific kernel symbol addresses are really needed in the process of privilege escalation. However, as mentioned by my partner before, KPTR restraints makes kernel symbol address hidden to non-root users. So reading the kernel symbols directly from the mobile phone is no longer possible. Then the question is coming. Is there a, is there a common way to get kernel symbol table? Of course. The answer is yes. We can retrieve kernel symbol table statically from the official room. The general process is as follows. First of all, we need to get the official room. 
Now most manufacturers provide room package downloads on their official websites. All we have to do is download the corresponding room based on the specific module. Uh, then we need to take out boot image from the official room. If the room is not encrypted, uh, we can normally unzip the file. However, if room is encrypted, it's not easy anymore. This is also the focus of the whole case. Skip here first. Uh, all details about encryption will be disc disclosed starting from the next page. Keep going. After getting the boot image, uh, we need to extract the kernel part from it. According to the file structure of the boot image and the related information in the boot header, the step is not difficult to achieve. The last thing to do is to retrieve the symbol table from the kernel image. For this, the storage format of the symbol table in the kernel binary needs to be made clear. Next, I will introduce the details of the encryption. We found that the file extension of the room downloaded from the official website became OZIP instead of, the, instead of previous OZIP. If we use a common decompression software to unzip this file, uh, we, we will get many checksum errors, uh, as shown in the right picture. Open the OZIP file with binary reading software. From the start of the OZIP file header, uh, we can get a series of numbers, which translated into Plan test gives OPPO encrypt, as shown in the picture below. Then we further analyze the encrypt file and draw a diagram of its file structure, uh, as shown in the right figure. Uh, the numbers in parentheses uh, represent the size of the corresponding part. We found that the size of, of each encrypt data block is 16 bytes, and the internal interval between every two encrypt data blocks is fixed. With the layout of the file, if we can break the encryption, uh, we can restore the entire file. So come quickly and take a look at the decryption process. By matching the OPPO encrypt string, uh, we found that there is a decryption process for OZIP file in recovery. So we conducted a further reverse analysis of the recovery binary. From the middle uh, at a screenshot, uh, we see that there is an AES ECB encrypt function the file encryption algorithm leaked here. However, just knowing the uh, encryption algorithm is not enough. We also need the secret key. Continue the reverse analysis. We are lucky to find the, the AES set encrypt key function. By contrasting with its function definition, we found that the content passed by the first parameter happens to be the secret key. Then we go to 11FB78 row data area. The key is stored there. Of course, and the request of the manufacturer, uh, we did some cover up on the secret key. In the end, what we need is to, what we need to do is happy to decrypt and uh, extract kill themes. Uh, the left part of the figure is the process of decrypting room and extracting the symbol table from boot image. The right part of the figure is, 
is a partial display of the final symbol table. Next is a case study for KSLR. The main content of this case consists of the following three sessions. The first session will give a brief introduction to the background of KSLR. The second session will explain the KSLR's implementation on Android kernel 4.4. 4. For the last session, the details of KSLR bypassing on Mi Note 3 will be introduced. Okay, let's go to the session one, KSLR background. As we all know, KSLR is short for kernel address space layout randomization, and the concept of it has been around for a long time. The period of introduction of KSLR feature is different for each architecture. Linux has supported KSR on x86 since version 3.14. But this feature is turned on by default uh, from Linux 4.12. KSR for ARM64 has only been available upstream since Linux 4.6. Especially for Android, it makes KSR available in Android kernel 4.4 and newer. KSR is a hardening feature that aims to make it more difficult to take advantage of no exploits in the kernel. It's most effective and uh, widely adopted to defense memory corruption vulnerabilities, such as buffer overflow and uh, use after free. In order to prevent an attacker from reliably jumping to, for example, a particular exploit function in memory, uh, KSR randomizes the location where kernel code is loaded on each reboot. Next is the second section, KSR for Android kernel 4.4. Let's take a look at the physical layout of kernel image in memory and the system startup. Without KSR turned on, a bootloader will place the kernel image in test offset bytes beyond the two megabytes aligned base. This is the ARM64 official requirements. But with KSR, bootloader will load the core kernel and a random uh, physical address. Later, the kernel image self uh, relocation routines will be carried out. The basis of the relocation face up is a random KSR offset. Look again at the final virtual kernel memory layout. Without KSR turned on, the kernel will be mapped at a fixed uh, virtual address space. But with KSR, the kernel will be mapped at a random virtual address in the Wimaloc area. Next, let's look at an example. On the Mi Note 3, with KSR turned on, a virtual camera kernel memory layout is different after each reboot. Uh, we can verify this by comparing uh, the related information in the red circle in the message. From this page, we will get into detailed code analysis. First, let's look at the macro definition of face offset and the main key image line. Combine the macro definition with the two lines of assembly code in the red circle. It's not hard to understand. This code is used to calculate the value of KSR offset and save it to X23 register. Here, the X23 register needs more attention because it appears multiple times later. In addition, one thing to note is that the 
initial value of the KLSR offsets default to zero in MC T4. So one of the questions we need to figure out below is how the value of KSR offsets finally obtained. To solve this doubt, we need to introduce another concept, KSR seed. Okay, let's continue. There is no doubt that randomization requires a good source of entropy. Unfortunately, um, this for does not have an architectured means of obtaining entropy. Uh, for example, where an instruction. Uh, so KSR requires bootloader support for passing hardware entropy through the device tree node. Back to the code. The first two lines of code is to judge whether randomization had been carried out before. Then jump to the KSR early init function, and the return one law of the function is finally recorded to the x23 uh, register. So we can infer that the calculation of the KSR offset is performed in this function. Next, let's look into it. Firstly, it retrieves the seed from the FDT and then uses this seed to calculate a suitable kernel image offset. In addition, system memory and kernel modules can also be randomized. We can map system memory and a random virtual address in the linear area. It's worth missing that. Uh, to prevent modules leaking the virtual address we call kernel, uh, separate randomization of kernel modules is also necessary. After getting KSR offset, the next operation is kernel image self-relocation. About this, there are two prior knowledge I want to share. The first one, the kernel binary needs to be able to relocate itself. During this process, the router session consists of standard ELF64 router entries will be mapped. And uh, the other one, uh, the self-relocation routines can take KSR offsets into account when applying the relocation face up after which the kernel will be able to execute from the virtual address after relocation. After a brief introduction, uh, we then proceed to the specific code analysis. Obviously, we can easily understand the meaning of the router offset and the router size based on their literal meaning. Rest of the code is to get kernel actual virtual offset and the location of the router session after randomization. Keep reading the code. This part is the call code for relocation. In order to better understand this code, I will first introduce the strut of the relocation entries. A relocation entries are necessary because it contains information that describe how to modify their session contents. The top right corner, top right corner, uh, is the definition of the elf ct 4 router structure. For its member uh, variables, are offset uh, indicates the location at which to apply the relocation action. Our info gives both the symbol table index with respect to uh, which the relocation must be made and the type of the relocation to apply. Our endend specifies a can stand endend user to compute the value uh, to be stored into the relocatable field. Combined with the definition of the structure, uh, we found the role of the first part uh, the code in the red circle uh, is to traverse all the relocation entries and uh, extract the corresponding uh, information. 
uh, correct oper op operation will be executed only when entries type is uh, RX64 relative. The code in the right circle below is relocation, is actual relocation calculation process. The last session, the details of KSR bypassing. The entire bypassing process can be roughly divided into three steps. Uh, step one, extract stat static kernel symbol address uh, from boot image. The process of extracting a static symbol table from the official room have already been described earlier. There is no more description here. Step two, capture the leaked symbol's real address from the message. This step is the key to the entire bypass process. We have two ways to get leaked warning information. The first way to, is using the warning information directly leaked uh, in, the mes in the message during the kernel startup as shown in the middle picture. We can see the leaked PC register and the LR register. Uh, the, but if we, if we don't catch the above info leak in time, uh, we can adopt the second way, uh, which is stable and uh, reliable. What it does is using POC to trigger specific warning information. With information leaked, the step three uh, is calculation the KASR offset by comparing static address and the real address of the same symbol. Uh, since then, KSR is bypassed. Next is a demo show. Uh, we demoed the above four cases at the same time. Four demos come from um, four different mobile phone manu manufacturers uh, in China. Uh, we first shown the version information for each model, uh, then protective measure bypassing, SELIN patching, and the local privilege escalation uh, were carried out one by one. Finally, uh, we verified that the corresponding process has obtained the root privilege. Then go to the su suggestions. After watching the demo, we have some of our own ideas or suggestions. First, patch the kernel timely to eliminate vulnerabilities. According to our research, a large part of exploits are from 1D uh, vulnerabilities, so timely patching is very necessary. The second, uh, ending mitigation is more than just uh, enable it. Some manufacturers just open the corresponding configuration of the mitigations, but whether these mitigations are really effective on their mobile phones, uh, they have not fully considered them. The third, mitigations should be used in combination. There are many methods of attack now, and it's difficult for a single protection to meet the requirements. The combined use of protective measures is a future trade. The last, Save sensitive data in trust on our hypervisor. Uh, there is no doubt that special prote protection against sensitive information increases the difficulty of exporting. Uh, then is the last part, conclusion. There are three takeaways I want to share with you. The first one, attacks and uh, defenses are not completely uh, antagonistic. 
uh, the relationship between them can be more properly uh, expressed and uh, complementary and uh, indispensable. The second one, in terms of defense, a perfect protection system requires a combination of multiple protection uh, mechanisms. But the trouble that comes with it is the balance between the security and the performance. The last one, to build a better Android security ecosystem, the cooperation among Google, smartphone, OEMs, and the security researchers is initial. Here are our references. The bow is all our content today. Thank you for your patience. If there are any questions, welcome to discuss with us. Thank you.